I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm Abigail Mollick. I'm a first year evening MBA student. I uh, went to Pennsylvania State University with a Bachelor's of Science in Mathematics. Uh, I moved out to San Diego about six years ago, started working for Qualcomm. Um, I'm actually currently still employed there. Uh, you know, I was actually in this room last year, sitting here thinking what, what was next for me, so, so I can feel for everyone here. So I uh, decided to come to the University of San Diego. I think some of the big things that I, reasons why I chose the University of San Diego was the, all the benefits that the program had to offer. Um, for me, you know, coming to school and going to class every night and getting that full-time feeling of being with a group of students who are here to achieve the same thing but on a part-time basis was really important for me. So the evening program was something that I was really looking for. I think also um, another big thing was the part-time travel abroad opportunities so that you know being able to work full-time and go abroad and get that global mindset as a leader was something that was really important to me so being able to do that already in just my first year here has really you know i think taken my education here to a next level uh, there's also a lot of opportunities with the sustainability that you might not get in any other programs around this area so that was something that also was a reason that i consider i'm um, also in the um, graduate business student association so that that's something that I know a lot about student life, so if you guys have any questions or anything, that would be something that I can definitely help answer there. So pass it to Paul to give you a little bit about himself. Thanks, Abby. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome. It was really nice talking with some of you this morning uh, over, over breakfast and coffee. Uh, so a little bit about myself. I uh, came from about seven years on active duty in the Marine Corps. Um, before that, I was a undergrad at University of Arizona. We're playing in the lead eight tonight, by the way. Uh, so bear down. Um, but just some, a little bit about why I came here. So I really like the international opportunity, Sim similar to what uh, Abby was mentioning. Just this last winter, I was in uh, Argentina and Brazil and got to do some hands-on work with a Brazilian client and actually present a, a business solution uh, to that client. And you know, really, really cool opportunities. The exposure you get here at the University of San Diego uh, internationally is, is uh, above and beyond. Also, another reason I, I chose the school was the access you get to the professors, and I've, I've seen that firsthand, um, both as a uh, graduate assistant here and then working with uh, some of the, the professors just off uh, outside of class has, has been incredible. They, you know, open door policy and really accessible and a lot to learn from them beyond just the classroom. So definitely something that I think is unique the school as well. So that's a little bit about me, and I'm really happy to be here. Similar to Abby also, I was in your shoes, sitting, uh, listened to two other MCs this time last year, and this, this first uh, semester and a half has been really incredible. So I'm excited for you, and I hope, uh, hope you get something from this tip this morning. So our agenda for today, just to give you a quick uh, overview, you'll hear from the dean this morning, Dean Pike. We're going to have a quick break. Then you'll get a chance to hear from our student panel and ask them some questions. We'll have another quick break, and then you'll go off to a sample class visit. And then finally, we'll uh, wrap it up with some lunch and uh, further Q&A session. OK, and then uh, next up is, is Dr. Uh, David Dean Pike. And he's a PhD in decision science from the Warden School, uh, University of Penn Pennsylvania in decision sciences. Prior to USD, he was also professor of operations management and the associate dean at the Tuck School of Business Administration in Dartmouth. And he has made major research contributions uh, in inventory models, production planning and scheduling, and global production and distribution systems. So without further ado, here's Dean Pike. So good morning. Welcome. Uh, you're going to have a great day and, and, uh, and uh, learn a lot. Feel free to ask any questions. Uh, Kate is going to give me a 10-minute warning, and I'm going to abruptly stop whatever I'm talking about and, and open it up for questions. So um, you're, you can fire away to me and to the students, and that's what this is all about, so that you really get to learn and, and make a good decision. I uh, actually started my career uh, out of college as a seventh and eighth grade math teacher. 
So uh, I used to tell my students at Tuck that I was uniquely qualified to teach 28-year-old MBA students <laughs> because I knew what it was. Okay, so anyway, what I want to do is, uh, is tell you a little bit about uh, some new strategic directions that, uh, that we've uh, engaged in uh, here at USD. Uh, and a little bit about the process, like 30 seconds on the process. So we, we about a year and a half ago, um, I had been here for five years uh, uh, this past summer. And so we, we started thinking we, we needed to take a look back, what we've accomplished over five years. It's incredible uh, what the faculty have done, our staff have done. It's really awesome. Um, but, but also now it's time to kind of look ahead. And so we were reading. Uh, in, in um, the Chronicle of Higher Education, the New York Times, The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, the list goes on about what's going on in higher education, what's going on in business education, and we said we, we need to really get out in front of this because the world is changing. And so uh, we, we talked to faculty staff, we had an all-day faculty retreat, we, we had a, a major board of advisors meeting, we have a board of advisors here at the, at the School of Business uh, with business leaders from around town and actually around the country. And, um, and so we, we engaged in all of that, and what emerged out of that is what I'm going to show you and just chat a little bit about here. So um, the things on the left are things that, that are kind of, we call inputs to, to this process, enhanced career services and uh, faculty development and support. I'll talk a little bit about uh, one of those. And then three key directions uh, or, or pillars. Uh, that we have. One is access to faculty. Paul talked about that. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, in a moment. One is, uh, we call it innovative and engaged pedagogy. Pedagogy is a fancy word that we use in academia for teaching. So how can we engage students better and be even more innovative, uh, leveraging some of the things that our faculty are already doing? I will touch on that because uh, it's pretty cool. And, uh, and the other is significant real world experience. And that's a direct response to so many people writing articles and thinking and, and even we have three boys all of whom have gone through college and, and me watching my boys graduate from great institutions of learning into the working world and have no clue how to deal with things because they never really had any real world experience in their, in their uh, university education. And so we said first of all we're already better than that and secondly we can go even further than anybody else because we have the, the capability here and the heart here to do that. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And all that comes together to say when employers are looking for people, they want them extremely well trained in what they're doing. Like I'm going to hire you to do finance or marketing or, or teamwork or whatever, and I'm going to hire you, and you need to be well trained in that area. We do that. But also really ready to hit the ground running when you get to the, the job, and we really uh, emphasize that a lot. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, okay? And uh, if I get cut off, we'll just deal with that. But let me start with career services. So um, we're actually undergoing a reorganization. We have career services at the business school and at the university. So the university deals with College of Arts and Sciences. Primarily, business school deals with our undergraduates and our graduate students. And uh, we're reorganizing some of that, you know, specifically within the MBA program. Uh, and then uh, at the university level, they're reorganizing and literally doubling the size of the career services staff. And then with our coordination, which we already do, but we're even leveraging more, the outreach to employers is going to go way up. And so I won't go through all of, of what we're doing with that, but it's pretty awesome to think about as we bring in some new people and as we kind of shift their responsibilities. Um, they have uh, a tremendous, in the MBA program in particular, a tremendous focus on uh, career and professional development. How do you write a resume? How do you interview? I mean, little things like that. How do you go out to dinner? With, uh, with an executive, and some of you may like, oh, I got that down, and, and a lot of times it's true, but a lot of times there, you know, there's just some training that helps polish a little bit more so that you present yourself best and you don't get thrown in the discard pile, right? So I don't know how many times I've seen a cover letter that has misspellings, uh, grammatical errors, it just doesn't sell the person very well, or it oversells, you know, sometimes they pop up and they have odor to them. I mean, it's weird what people put in a cover letter and a resume, and it's like, forget that one. 
So our goal is that your cover letter, your resume, your interview skills, everything presents the best that you have to offer. And we, we're, we already do that. But the new emphasis will be even more on external, finding the firms here, LA, San Francisco, Seattle, Chicago, New York, where that, uh, that will be kind of really wanting to come in and find you. So that's uh, some of what we're doing. Let me just um, highlight two other things. One is we have a very, very active LinkedIn group. It went from zero people, I think we're probably over 8,000 now, among our students and alumni. And, uh, what, and, and so this happens to me all the time. And I'll just tell you, I have about, I, I, I can't remember, 1,500 maybe contacts on uh, LinkedIn. Any of my former students when I was at, at Dartmouth, um, if they want to connect, I connect. Anybody with a USD affiliation, student or alumni, if they want to connect, I connect. And then you get to look through my list. And I get emails, uh, or emails or LinkedIn uh, mails that say, Dean Pike, I understand that you know someone who's at this consulting firm, or at this investment bank, or at this uh, firm up in uh, the Bay Area. Can you introduce me to that person, right? So it's not only me. We have parents, we have alumni, and I, I travel, literally travel the world meeting with these folks. And I, I'm here to tell you 100% of the time, when I say, would you be willing to talk to a student and give them some advice? And sometimes, especially a parent who's, you know, at, a, at an investment bank in Manhattan, they will say, and this, these are exact words, I can't guarantee them a job, but I will give them an at-bat. That's an English term for I'll give him a shot at it. And, uh, and, and he did. And one of our students got the shot, got the internship, then got the full-time job. Now he's doing really well. Guess what's going to happen? He's going to say, you know what, that next cadre we're going to hire, let's go back to USD and find people. That's the leverage you get from a school this size, from a network this strong. And it's really a fun thing to watch. OK. so. Um, that's enough for right now on uh, career services, but, um, but we really, really take it seriously and, uh, and come alongside you wherever you are. Some people are already way down the path and some uh, need a little help. Um, uh, Paul and Abby talked about access to faculty, um, and, and this is a big deal. Uh, you've heard of the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, that's where I did my PhD. I taught for two years there as a doctoral student. And I went back and taught there for two years uh, when I was on sabbatical from, from Tuck. And um, one year I had uh, 360 MBA students in, in uh, six different sections. One year I had uh, about 180 in three different sections. And my experience when I was at Tuck is a lot like here. It's smaller classes, um, it's a smaller school, and, and I have friends to this day in fact, I was with some the other night who were students of mine. One guy, 1990, I think, was a student of mine, something like that. Way back, still friends, right? That was the kind of experience that I had. So here I am at Wharton. I can count on this hand the number of MBA students who walked into my office, and I'm teaching them. Actually, I was a pretty good teacher. And, and so, and, you know, and, and I'm not a very threatening guy, so, uh, you know, it wasn't like, I have to, I can't go to the professor's office. It's like, you know, come, ask, come here. And here's my office. But that, that's about how many would actually come to your office. PhD students would come all the time. I used to tell people, Wharton is an awesome place to be a PhD student. You walk into your faculty office, your advisor's office, anytime. MBA students, they just don't do it. That's not true here. So let me tell you some of the, wow, that's hard to see. Uh, top right, Jen Mueller is uh, one of our faculty she teaches organizational behavior, both the undergrad and MBA level, uh, teamwork, uh, leading teams, and things like that. Um, she studies creativity. We stole her from Wharton, actually. Uh, she was a professor at Wharton. And, uh, and she's quoted, you'll see her, I heard her the other day, I heard her on NPR, not KPBS, NPR, National Public Radio, because her research into creativity talks about and investigates how organizations are incredibly good at squashing creativity. 
Every single one of them, and I've seen the surveys, will say we have incredibly complex, challenging problems, and our number one need is for creative people who can attack these problems from perspectives that we just don't have. And then what do they do? <laughs> Squash that creativity. It's unbelievable. And she studies why. And she said, they call them cues in this sort of behavioral research. She studies what kind of cues that you present to people to get into their minds so that either that, that lets them continue in that squashing sort of behavior or changes their mindset so they actually encourage creativity. How cool is that? And how important? There's no wonder she gets quoted in The Economist and the Wall Street Journal and NPR because everybody wants to know this stuff. Top left is, uh, uh, I'm not going to do her whole name, we call her Professor Priya, that's Ranga Priya Kanan Narasimhan, but uh, we call her Professor Priya, so do the students, and um, thankfully, otherwise you'd spend your whole day pronouncing her name, and uh, she, st she just got her PhD a few years back from UCLA, unbelievable teacher, students love her, and uh, she teaches strategy, right now bringing up a course in the MBA program on new product development, and her research is in innovation in large organizations. Interestingly, ex so creativity, coming up with the new ideas, innovation, taking new ideas and, and implementing, right? Creating new products and services out of them. And, and so that, what her research is, how is it that huge organizations, small organizations, who are innovative by definition, squash innovation? It's unbelievable. And how then do innovators in those organizations find the resources and, the, uh, and so on to actually create innovation? Guess where her research was done? Silicon Valley. So she studied high-tech companies, and I actually saw her present this uh, research in Silicon Valley to a group of our alumni from all over, you know. And uh, you can't believe how many questions there were every time. She was, you know, I mean, just constant people wanting to know more because it's an innovative place. And I think they were actually, our alumni were actually in organizations like LinkedIn and Apple and others, and they were feeling that same thing that she's describing. You know, we're trying to be innovative, but it's hard. And she's helping people figure out how to change that. Let's see, I could go on and on. Um, uh, let, me, let me just, I'm gonna drop to the bottom. On the bottom left is Barbara Luigi. Uh, talk about access to faculty. She teaches accounting. Now, introductory accounting, MBA program. This might be the most boring subject on the planet. And people running for the exits as fast as they can. And, and Barbara will win, sorry, Professor Luigi, will every day, every year will win Professor of Impact, Professor of the Year, and so on. I had a student tell me one time, I got my job because of her. It's a marketing guy. But he went in and he, had no, he knew how to sort of decipher the financial statements of the company. He's applying for the marketing position, but he went in and took the financial statements and said, let me, let me talk to you about this, and they gave him the job. That's because of her. Well, the other thing is she shows up on Saturday mornings to do reviews. In fact, is she doing the mock class today? She's doing one of the mock classes. You'll get to see her in action. It's, it's, I, I don't know how she does it, but it's really incredible. Bottom right is Thomas Yang. Thomas, is, um, he actually teaches a few undergraduate classes and a brand management class for the MBA. We call him uh, an adjunct faculty. He's helping us with a whole bunch of other stuff right now, too. He's on my board of advisors, but um, he was a uh, marketing executive at Procter & Gamble, um, I think Coke. Um, he ran all of International for Starbucks uh, and for Callaway Golf just up the road here. And uh, now he teaches for us brand management. So it's pretty access to great faculty. And it is open door policy. You can walk in anytime. Ask him about jobs, careers, homework, you name it. And that's true. Okay, real world experience, another key. Uh, for us, for an MBA program, and so on. I'm just going to highlight a few things, but um, I could go on and on. We did a review of the MBA program a couple years back and redesigned the whole thing from scratch, basically. And what we said was, well, we, we need to look at all the best programs on the, on, on, in the world. Uh, we need to talk to students and alumni, which we did. We need to have focus groups, and we need to interview employers. So we went out and talked to a whole bunch of employers, dozens, and we asked them, what are you looking for in an MBA? graduate, and we got all kinds of information. Remarkably consistent information, it turns out, between, say, marketing and finance and operations, you know, I mean, you name it, the uh, international business, and all of them were saying essentially the same thing, which I'll tell you about sometime. 
Anyway, we, one of the things we heard is uh, you need to do some things, um, uh, dial it up in terms of um, some of the deeper tools. So we felt pretty good about the tools that we were giving students, but uh, we had investment banks telling us it's just, it, it has to be that your students have financial statement analysis course ready to you know, hit, so you, how you analyze statements if you're doing a deal, merger, acquisition, leverage buyout, or whatever. You gotta be able to do that. So we don't, that's, if you wanna be a finance emphasis, you gotta take that class. You wanna go into uh, uh, banking, you gotta take that class. Uh, you don't, you don't have to. But, uh, so, but we, we said we gotta dial it up. We talked to marketing companies or marketing roles within companies. Uh, I think especially at the undergraduate level, we have students coming in saying, I'm creative, I wanna go into marketing, I like to draw things, I love Budweiser advertisements, I'm a marketing person, and, and the employers were telling us, no, you're not. Creative is good, but you gotta be able to do the data analysis, the marketing research, the analytics, um, maybe not the big, big data, but so we have dialed up the, the, that sort of quant side, quantitative side of marketing, so you don't wanna go into marketing, those folks out there looking for you want you to have that level of depth. And so uh, we have a great course in, in marketing research. Um, we have a course in investment banking, Marco Swatina, he's a superstar professor. We also have people telling us uh, we wanna change the world. And that's actually true with nearly every student I talk to and a lot of companies that say, you know what, it's great to go out and make a lot of money and I'd like to do that, but I wanna have a significant impact on the world, either on the environment or on poverty or on uh, uh, issues with trafficking or whatever. That, you know, the list goes on and on. Where, what, what really drives the passions of, uh, of folks. One of our boys has, has really kind of taken, he went to Cambodia to work at a home for trafficked girls on a semester off in, in college. And, you know, I mean, you watch what he's so, you know, when he gives his money away, uh, international justice mission and places like that, right? It just kind of burns in his heart. And, and so we have a course, I think this is a retire, required course actually, called Sustainable Business Model Design. And the, and the whole point is, uh, I think that's the name, don't keep, hold me to it. But the, the point is create a business model that uses market kinds of things so that you have a sustainable, not philanthropy-based, but market-based solution to some of these problems. It's easy to say, I'll just have people give me a lot of money and then I'll go and I'll give it away or make a difference. But what happens when they stop giving you the money? Now you got a problem. And so we're saying we want to we want to make a significant impact on people and on the planet and on profits, but it has to be sustainable, right? So that's uh, and students, that's your job, is to come up with those models uh, with a lot of advice uh, from faculty, and you present them to real executives from uh, from the world, not just to each other and say, well, that was a great idea. No, the real executives are going to be there, kind of picking away so that you refine and sharpen what you're doing. Okay, we also have a bunch of business leaders come to campus all the time. I've just highlighted a couple here. Gary Ridge is the CEO of WD-40, the spray can stuff, and um, he's a great guy. He's on our board of advisors here. Uh, Aussie, so you'll love his accent. J.D. Power, do you know this one? J.D. Power Associates, the award, if you watch football, you'll see the car advertisements, and you know, it seems like everybody won the award, but I don't know. Anyway, he's coming. His son Jamie is on our trustees here at the university. Great, great guy. And, and this is Dave Power. He goes by, but anyway, um, he's uh, coming next week, actually. You're welcome to come. Uh, open session in here, 1245. I can't remember. Thursday, I think, if I'm right. Um, Chris Crane on the left, Edify. I'll tell you on a break what he does. He's also on our board, um, but uh, he was here for two days. He's doing for-profit schools in Africa and Dominican Republic. For-profit schools for extremely poor people. I said, Chris, that'll never work. It works. <laughs> he knows better than I do and how to work. He's in Africa all the time and he's just an awesome guy. Al Carey, I don't have a picture because I, I couldn't find the good one, but uh, he's the president of Pepsi Beverages, one of our parents of an, uh, a student who graduated a year or two ago and um, has helped some of our students get into Frito-Lay where he was the CEO. And uh, he's a great guy, most down-to-earth guy you'll ever meet. Seriously, just a normal guy, and he's the president, rep reports to Indra Nuri, uh, CEO of, of uh, Pepsi. Amazing guy to have come speak. And then on the bottom right, Lorenzo Fertitta, Ultimate Fighting Championship. He's one of our alums. Some of you will run away when you hear this, but uh, some of you are like, all right. I, t I will tell you this, 
when we announce that he's coming, this room is packed, packed. And there's a line of people who come up and want their picture taken with Lorenzo. He often brings Dana White, who's more of the face of the organization. And uh, these are sort of edgy guys, but they are great business people. You listen to his presentation, and you realize this is not just putting a couple guys in an octagon and letting them go at it. I mean, they are really smart business people. So it's a great learning experience. And then that's another list. I want you to read all of those real quick. And um, that's an advertisement we took out just to let people know, hey, we're pretty real world here. OK, innovative and engaged pedagogy. Abby and, and Paul talked about um, uh, global, and so we have all kinds of uh, experiences abroad. Uh, I love that stuff. I've taught all over, taught in Japan and, and Western Europe and Finland and uh, China and other places. And uh, it's just what an eye-opening, wonderful experience. We had an orientation lunch. You'll experience this uh, hopefully next fall. Um, where we were sitting around, I was at a table with another faculty member and, and then six students, and we had three countries. I'm like, wow, this is pretty cool. And it was a pretty engaged conversation. I get up to leave. And uh, Professor Daniel Lin, who just walked in, and Professor Marco, so Daniel teaches uh, operations, Hi, Shan -shan. and uh, Daniel's wife, Shan Shan, and, um, and uh, Marco Svetina, who teaches finance, who's from uh, uh, Croatia. And, uh, and I said, we had three countries at my table. And Daniel and Marco said, we had eight seats, two of us and six students, eight countries. How cool is that? And then you start listening to the conversation where somebody from New Jersey, that doesn't count as a different country, but it might. And, and, and someone from, I was born in New Jersey, so I picked it intentionally. But uh, I'm, I'm certain to offend somebody if I, anyway. So New Jersey and someone from India, Brazil, China, um, uh, Serbia, I mean, you, you name it. And, and the conversation about how you do business just elevates like crazy. It is very very cool. Anyway, you get the opportunity multiple times, actually, to go study abroad and do consulting projects. I put WD-40 there because we have students who did a project for WD-40 in Shanghai. Uh, and I mean, they come back, and you know, the learning experience is unbelievable. Those of you who've ever done business in China, this was industrial side, not the consumer side. And, uh, and I've done a lot of stuff in China, and, and it turns out that the, the distribution systems are not straightforward. Uh, we use the word Byzantine. Uh, so they were, they were helping WD-40 kind of navigate and strategize about that. Uh, and all over the place, there's uh, students in the bottom right uh, in Uganda, I think, is where they were at that time, working with, um, uh, with entrepreneurs and so on. So we had all those kinds of things. Oh, we had students last January in, um, in uh, uh, Dubai. This is Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum. I, which one do you think he is in the picture? Yeah, you can find him. That's, uh, so, and that's our MBA students and some of our faculty who were there. Dubai is a, an amazing place. If you haven't been, you should take the opportunity. It's a really, really unique uh, environment. One of our students actually left that project, went to Abu Dhabi. He's trying to get a job in the Middle East, applied to go to Riyadh, uh, Saudi Arabia, and uh, couldn't get the visa. It takes a long time. Um, I've done that from Dubai to Kuwait to Saudi, and it's quite an amazing thing. Innovation and entrepreneurship, we have a competition next week called Venture Vetting. It's a whole year-long process, or uh, uh, academic year-long process that leads up. It's actually teams from all over campus, MBAs, undergrads, peace studies, law school. We have students from all over campus forming teams and coming up with new business ideas and presenting them. If you've ever seen the show Shark Tank, it's kind of like that. They present them to three or four, I can't remember this year, angel investors. We raise money, that give them $50,000 and say, look, guys, angels, investors, you don't have to give this money to anybody. If you don't think there's a good idea, don't give it away. We'll keep it for next year. If you think one of them has got the best idea and deserves $50,000, give all 50 to that one. If you want to divide it evenly, it's your call as investors. That's the way we did it. Rather than first place gets 10,000, second place gets 5,000, you know, that sort of thing, which is kind of arbitrary and too structured. One of our students happened to be an undergrad, got a $10,000 award. He was the, the highest one uh, last year. He used that to, to employ himself and another student over the, engineering student over the summer. 
Um, uh, and then he actually parlayed that into free space at Evo Nexus downtown, it's an incubator. And he parlayed that into $800,000 of funding. And I had dinner with him a week or so ago up in the Bay Area where he and now six people are taking the business to the next level uh, with $800,000 of funding because he got refinement in practicing for and getting mentoring for standing up here and giving a presentation to these angel investors. It was really awesome. We do exactly the same thing except on the social side. So social innovation, people, planet, and profit. And uh, we have some 100 teams. Um, and uh, actually, the V2 competition is bringing over some teams from Tijuana. They're bringing, I think it's three teams or six teams from uh, universities in, in Mexico to come and be part of our competition as well. So we got this cross-border international thing going on. And my hope is some of our students will look at some of their students and say, I love your idea. I've got some, some connections and resources. And all of a sudden, you get really amazing cross-border, cross-functional ideas that bubble up in the cool new companies. So that's what's going on. Um, let me just highlight this. This is actually faculty and staff. But um, part of uh, innovative learning and engaged learning is doing some things outside of the classroom. And so you'll have uh, a thousand opportunities, probably more, to do social service things um, in the community. Uh, some of them are global. A lot of them are right here. And that's a bunch of us, again, a little hard to see. But that's a bunch of us who went to Montgomery Middle School right up here on the road in, in Linda Vista, that way, uh, in Linda Vista, and helped them with a community garden they had. So we're up there you know, getting dirty and sweaty, working alongside fifth through eighth graders. That was a hoot. And, uh, and uh, digging and planting and doing all kinds of stuff like that. To kinda it's a very under-resourced area. Um, and uh, so it was a lot of fun. The point of all of this uh, is that you are prepared in unprecedented ways for the real world. You have the technical depth of the classroom learning. You have the real world experience. Of, uh, you have the global experience. You have the social mindset to say to employers that I am really ready to add value to your organization. And so uh, this is the top, this is a, a year or so old, so um, I haven't updated this slide, but uh, the top 25 employers of our MBA students, including companies like Qualcomm, uh, UTC Aerospace, what do we have? Cisco, you know them, Amazon, Booz Allen Hamilton Consulting Company, US Navy, of course, Life Technologies, which is a big uh, biotech here in town, recently bought. Corning makes the, 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 the glass on your laptop, that's them. Um, uh, almost 100% certain they'll do that, Hewlett Packard and others. And then other notable ones, including NASA and Target and Google and eBay and StubHub and some other cool companies where our students just over the last few years have gone. Now, this is not a guarantee slide. You can't walk in and say, OK, I, I saw the Angels baseball club. I'd like to work for the Red Sox. <laughs> Actually, I would. I um, uh, love the Red Sox. But, uh, but, you know, and so, you know, hey, get me a job with, with the Red Sox. You, you know, it's not that. We're here. They're here. And uh, you're here to put, you know, work together to create the environment and the, and the uh, training uh, so that you can really sing when you go out. I'm going to stop there and, uh, and open it up for questions if you have, because uh, Kate has given me the 10 minute, which is now, I think, eight minute warning. So f what can I answer for you? In one sentence, YUSD, access to great faculty, global opportunities. How is that? Two phrases. Strong network. OK, I'm going to take the next question, because I'll keep going on, and I'll go out of, out of my time. Where do you see this going in the next five to 10 years? Back to that slide that you saw with, uh, with uh, strategic directions. That is what I see, oops, went right by it. What I see in the next five, I'm not going to do 10 because that's, you know, but uh, uh, is this, that the world will recognize us, that when they, they are looking at you as students and graduates of USD, they'll understand that you're a heck of a lot better trained than other people who sit in a lecture hall with, with 100 students 
uh, or even in a class with 65 students, but can never actually talk to your faculty member and get that kind of sharp edge that you get outside of the classroom. And that, uh, that because of that, because of our global experiences, because of the network that we have and the unique ways that we teach, you will be prepared for the world in, in ways that you know, other schools just can't match. We'll be recognized for that. And you will be the banner carriers for that because your employers are going to say, yeah, I want more. I was, in, uh, I was at Citi, uh, Citibank in New York um, in the fall. I go every year to visit with uh, the Wall Street Journal and Business Week and our alumni. I was talking with a parent, it turns out, of uh, one of our students, uh, Tom Cole. He runs a huge fixed income, so billions of dollars of uh, fixed income part of Citi uh, trading and um, asset management. He actually had hired one of our students, a young woman. She was an undergrad alum. And I hadn't tracked it, and then I just discovered. Uh, Rachel had gone from Bank of America here to San Francisco to City in New York. And uh, she had in mind, I want Manhattan, I want banking, and she did it. And Tom Cole tells me, get me any more students like Rachel, and I'll hire them tomorrow. Exact words. That's what I think is going to happen. It already is. I just showed you. But anyway, other questions? Yeah. At any given time. So the cool thing is, actually, you're in a cohort. If you come in in the full-time cohort, you're in that cohort for for uh, a semester. Just those people. So and the, the international track. So where you have two languages and, and uh, two international experiences, you're in that cohort. If you're an evening MBA, you're, you're in that cohort. So you get this really tight connection with those folks um, and build a strong, strong friendships and network. It's amazing. Then we actually blend you. So you now you triple or more, actually more than triple, your, your network. Um, and, uh, and it's kind of a unique model and kind of awesome. John, John. So, um, so there are some programs, this is not one of them, that are very menu driven, right? So um, they have essentially very few. Uh, University of Chicago is like this. It's sort of totally market, everything. So they have very few core courses, and then you sort of choose whatever you want to take. Our opinion is different than that. So someone may have worked, and I've seen this, I taught at Tuck for 21 years. I had students who came in and they were experts, experts in my area's operations and supply chain. They, were, they had done operations or run some big piece of a supply chain for the US Navy or whatever. And what I learned in that process was they were really, really good in that little piece here. But the kinds of material that I was delivering weren't this, they were this. And so my point of view was, and they would come into my office sometimes, I should be able to opt out of your class because I know it all. OK, let's talk. And sometimes they, uh, they would. But, uh, but uh, you know, when I start talking, well, you know, what do you know about lean manufacturing? What do you know about global supply chain and uh, the sales and operations planning process, or, you know, et cetera? And, um, and they would glaze over, you know. But I really know, you know, quality management for something. And so uh, our point of view here, and there was that, that even if you're really, really strong in one area, almost certainly you're going to really build uh, broader capabilities. So we have a fairly strong core uh, that, that we think builds you the, the, the base to be a general manager. Um, I taught for Accenture for many, many years on the side and a supply chain class with two guys from Stanford and two of us from Tuck. And, and we, uh, they, I, they would come up and ask all the time, should I get an MBA? And I would, my first question back was, what do you want to do? And if somebody said, I want to, my goal in life is to be a supply chain manager, I'd say, I have an idea. Why don't you get a master's of supply chain management? Because that'll really drive that uh, for you. We actually have one here. But, um, but if somebody said, you know what I'd really like to do? Start my own company. I'd like to be a general manager, run the whole business unit, be the CEO, run the whole thing. Uh, work for a nonprofit, but have a have a, a, a perspective on everything. I'd say that's when you need an MBA because you want the breadth as well as the depth. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, you want me to answer that, or you want our admissions director to answer that question? Oh, it's like a general. I'm not asking about Yeah, because I won't give you those. But uh, um, <clears throat> so we want people uh, who are smart. That's a broad term, right? There's quant smart. There's there's creative smart. You know, so there are a lot of different kinds of smart. But we want people who are smart, who are motivated, who want to be leaders. And, uh, and want to change the world. Now, for me, uh, and this is true, if somebody says, I'm going to change the world and I'm going to go work for an international justice mission and I'm going to use my MBA to help them run their operations in, in, uh, in Calcutta better, great! Somebody else says, I'm going to change the world when I go to work in brand management for Procter & Gamble and we're going to do it in an ethical way, but we're going to do it really well. I'm like, great! So I don't have an opinion about which sector you go in or anything like that, but, but we want people who are going to be leaders uh, as they go on in their career and really have an impact uh, uh, for the community, for their companies, uh, et cetera. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think we're the best. So, so, um, so I, I think there's, there's a divide in the MBA world. Two minutes. Okay, so let me, let me do this real quickly. Um, there's the, the, the world where they emphasize research a lot, and we do because we want you learning from really smart people who are up to date on, their, uh, on the world, right? I don't want you learning from somebody who's up to date 20 years ago. That's why we emphasize research. But the programs, uh, okay, so like Wharton, where uh, in the in discussions about tenure and promotion and all that kind of stuff, teaching doesn't even enter the conversation, uh, I think are, are not what we're on about. So when you talk about access to great faculty, you're talking about faculty and innovative and engaged pedagogy. You're talking about faculty who care about students and care about teaching, but are also uh, really great at research. So let me tell you, I came from one that was like that, Tuck School at Dartmouth. Uh, we called it there, we call it here, dual excellence. Excellence in teaching, excellence in research, and those work together to create the environment. There are very few like that. I talk to other deans all the time, and it's hard to find a dean who has a perspective on why they, they oh, I, we have to do research. What? Have to? No. You love to do research because it's fun and because you're up to date and because you take that knowledge and you deliver it in the classroom with the students. That's a key thing. Um, so I, I, I think Tuck does a fantastic job of that aspect. Um, there are a lot of schools that don't give you much real-world experience, but there are some that require 100% of students to study abroad, 100% uh, of students to start a company or to write a business plan. I actually, I don't think that's myself, I don't think that part is a good idea because not everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. But to have 100% of students actually, in, like in our full-time program, doing consulting projects, pretty, pretty awesome. So. Um, uh, Yale, for instance, requires, at least they used to, require 100% of students to do a study abroad. I thought that was a pretty bold move. Uh, and uh, I'm sure they're providing some financial support to, to make that happen. So those are some that, that uh, I think are great, great uh, MBA programs. I can go on on the break. I think one more, because uh, Kate has given me the peace sign. Anybody else? Yeah, so I know Rady very well, um, uh, and they, they do indeed. Uh, the, the old tagline was innovators under construction. Um, and so 70%, I think the number was last I heard, uh, of their students have an advanced degree in science or medicine or technology or something like that. And it really is like 100% oriented around starting your own company. So taking entrepreneurs and giving them business tools to, uh, to, to start or take their uh, young companies to the next level. Like I said, with, with our V2 competition, we do that. We have, all, we have courses, we have experiences, we have funding for that sort of thing. But we don't say everybody's doing that. Because the students I talk to want to go and do strategic management or investment banking or consulting or other things in addition to starting their own company. I don't know the San Diego State program very well. Um, uh, so I'm going to give you one anecdote, and I'm going to offend somebody, so you know, don't turn the tape recorders off. 
But I was at breakfast with a friend of mine who actually has served as a mentor. All of our full-time students get a mentor from local business executive. And, um, and he's done that uh, and, and, and has told me multiple times, your students are amazing. Just bloom. And this guy's the chief operating officer. You know, he's taking companies public. You know, he's, he's the real deal. And, and he's just blown away by our students. Uh, he had a team of students from a local state university, I won't name it, that, um, that came in to do a consulting project with his company. And he's thinking, oh boy, they're going to come in and they're going to have, you know, they're going to be polished and they're going to have all kinds of great questions. And I'm not going to be able to answer. He was kind of nervous about it, even though, you know, he is what he is and, you know, seasoned executive and all of that. He, was, he told me he was completely underwhelmed. That, uh, that he just thought they, they were not very well prepared, they were not very professional, they did not ask good questions, and he didn't get much out of it. Whereas when he sits down with, with our students, he's literally blown away. I mean, those are the, 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 the terms he uses. So I think that's, there's, but that's, that doesn't tell you what happens in the classroom, that's more of a cultural kind of thing, or maybe it's just the students, what they bring to the experience, I don't know. But. Okay, we're going to stop there, take a break. Thank you. Have a fun day.